Hey guys, this is Mark Goldberg from Mark Vlogs Watches and I am accompanied by my, my gal Friday. And uh, you know, I'm just trudging around the property here a little bit uh, on the little dog farm. I'm looking for a little bit of shade so that we can have an important discussion about the nature of life, the nature of obsession, perfectionism, OCD, horology, and of course, ultimately, and eventually, doesn't it all just boil down to Rolex? Rolex! So let's, before we roll the credits, let's roll the Lex with a quick fist watch check. Here's the topic of our admiration discussion and this particular video. Quick commercial interlude. I co-authored this book with my friends, the monks of New Skeet. It's called Let Dogs Be Dogs. If you purchase it for the dog lover in your life, you'll be helping me support the channel. Also, please, dear God, subscribe. It's free this week only, and it really helps me out. Fist watch check in three, two, one. And today, ladies and gentlemen, I use that term loosely, I'm wearing the Rolex Submariner and we need to talk about the nature of this watch, what it is, what it represents, and what we're going to wear it for, how we're going to use it. Are we going to baby it? Are we going to use it? Let's talk about this now. You know, uh, I'm an old guy. <laughs> and the funny thing is, is that when I first, you know, when I first acquired my first Rolex, it would have been in uh, somewhere around in the mid 80s. And it was a date just. And it was expensive. I don't even remember exactly what it cost, but it was probably around $2,000 for a two-tone date just, which I still have, and I will drop a picture of it in right here. Okay, so I still have that baby, and um, I remember when I bought it, it was the, you know, Rolex is, for, well, ever since I've been alive, Rolex is the I made it kind of a wristwatch brand, but, um, the Submariner was never the I made it individual model. It was the Datejust, so that's what I got when I was a young, budding, you know, <laughs> full of myself, young Turk, fancied myself a bit of a business executive. You know, now look at me, I'm a dog farmer, which quite frankly, I love a lot more. But at any rate, um, so I remember going into the authorized dealer and looking at all the watches, and there were those Submariners, those sports watches, but those were cheaper, they were not flashy, they were not polished, they were not gold. You know, basically nobody wanted them. I, I paid something in the vicinity of $2,000 for a watch that today I could probably resell for $2,500, <laughs> you know, maybe. Whereas if I had bought that stinking Submariner with its plastic crystal and its hollow center links and its crappy stamped clasp, if I, if I would have bought whatever the reference number was in you know, 85, 86, if I would have bought that one, um, I would have paid six, seven, eight hundred dollars for it, and <laughs> it would have had tritium. It would be, it would be creamy. It would have patina, and uh, you know, today it would be worth something, you know, closer to ten, twelve thousand dollars. So, you know, just speaking purely economically, I made the wrong decision. You know, so but you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. Why did I buy the the date? It wasn't a date just actually. It was a date thirty four millimeter. Uh, you know, just as a quick aside though, for a 34 millimeter, it has a little bit of wrist presence because of the gold Jubilee bracelet. It's a little flashy. So, you know, it's not as dinky feeling as you would think, but I, certainly I don't wear it very much these days. That's for sure. But at any rate, back to the original topic at hand, why didn't I buy the Submariner in that era? And that is because the Submariner was like a working watch. It was legit a tool watch and I wasn't a diver. Oh, by the way, I am wearing the Rolex hat the swag which I received from the authorized dealer with my Sea Dweller 50th anniversary. Okay, so, but here's the thing, that Rolex, it was a working watch. Now, I don't want to say it was like a working man's watch because, you know, back in those days probably wasn't a whole lot of, um, you know, ditch diggers wearing them. But it was, uh, it was, a, it was a tool and, um, you know, and I was a business executive, so I was probably a bit of a tool too. But I, I think you understand what I'm saying. They were a purpose-built watch. They were made to fit a specific purpose. They were rough and tumble. They were not considered a luxury item. I wanted a luxury item fit for a business guy, and the Submariner just wasn't it. Oh, how things change. Oh, how things change. So, um, what has happened uh, in the history of the Submariner are a, a tremendous amount of good things. I mean, I, I know a lot of you are not fans of this super case 
with those widened lugs as you're seeing them there. The, uh, the older ones were a lot narrower. narrower. Hey, you know what? I'm gonna, drop, I'm gonna drop into the description here in the comments section uh, a link to a video I made comparing the new Rolex to the old style Rolex, because I, I actually do have one of each. And have a look, and then you'll really get a hold of the differences. But you know, by and large, in my opinion, the differences are extremely positive especially since I'm like an older guy now. Wrist presence is a good thing, has nothing to do with age, but like look at the, um, look at the dial, the maxi dial. It, with the maxi dial, the hands are bigger, the hour you know, plots are bigger, the loom is brighter, it just, I can read it with, with these eyes. So you know, that's what I like about it. So that's one of the things that occurred over the ensuing you know, 30 years since I you know, bought a Rolex uh, and, and you know, in theory bought the wrong one. But another thing happened and that is, this watch sort of ceased to become a tool watch and it became a luxury item and everybody wants these to the point where now this watch which is by no means the most expensive in the rolex lineup is, is just almost impossible to get and if you want one you're going on a waiting list you know now i got this one it's new to me but it's used it is a 2012 right and here we are in 2019 so it's a seven-year-old watch but honestly it looks freaking looks shit spanking new um and that's the thing they haven't changed the production on these kind of like those 90s mercedes benz where they just didn't change the the body style for so long that you know it didn't matter if you bought a five-year-old one looked new and that is pretty much true of rolex over the last you know seven eight nine years but the watch ceased to become a working watch and it became a luxury item. I mean, you gotta stand online for six, seven months, eight months to get this watch. In fact, why don't you tell me in the comments if you have one, if you've tried to get one, what has your experience been walking into the authorized dealer or trying to get one of these things? Do you have one? How did you get it? You know, what are your thoughts about, about how exclusive the Rolex Submariner has become? Um, it's a little obnoxious and I know many of you are angry at Rolex for making it so difficult to go ahead and get that watch. But when you have got to stand in line and pay $10,000 almost for a watch by the time you pay taxes or VAT, you know, depending on where you live, are you really going to dig ditches in it? Are you really going to do manual labor in it? And um, so I found when I got this that I was just babying it and being careful. But what that meant was I wasn't wearing it a whole lot. And I've come to a decision, guys, and, and that is I, I think I'm just going to make it my beater watch. So I want you to tell me, am I crazy? Like, um, I'm gonna show you, I've already gotten a good scratch on it. Well, I'll, I'll take a picture of the scratch um, and, and I'll drop it in right here. As we roll the picture up, you'll see this scratch on the high polished flank of the clasp. I can feel it with my finger now, it's a little deep. I don't even know how I got that scratch. I probably got it on a dog kennel because you know, I'm a dog trainer and I'm reaching in and out of metal crates and uh, kennels and leashes. And you know, I, hand, I deal with a lot of metal and sharp edge stuff, I guess. So uh, you know, maybe that's how it happened. But I, I think really the only thing that I could do to this thing that would really upset me wouldn't be a scratch like the one I showed you. It would be a major gunk. <laughs> you know, like if I got a huge dent in it, that would bug me because to repair that, you know, you'd have to get it laser welded where they like fill it in with material and then like laser weld some material in there to make up for the missing chunk. And, uh, and then, you know, and then they buff to make the edge look original. So, uh, I mean, that's a lot of trouble and, and I don't even know what that costs. But, I, you know, I don't want that to happen. So I'm like really hopeful that I don't put like a major, you know, dent in this thing. However, if I scratch it up, okay, look, it's got so many brush surfaces on the, uh, on the bracelet. Boy, don't they do lovely brush surfacing? And you know, a lot of that I could kind of, you know, if something sort of nasty happens, I can buff it out with a 3M, the, the scrubby part of a 3M sponge and uh, restore a little bit that way. The sort of um, scratch that you've seen on the clasp, or if I should get those on the flanks, I can uh, fix those relatively easily with a Cape Cod cloth if I hit it once a year or so. And then whenever this watch goes in for service, I can have Rolex kind of, you know, fix it up a little bit. And uh, that, you know, they can restore it and make it look like new. So I am determined to take this watch and treat it like the tool watch that it is intended to be. Um, I want to wear it. I don't want to be paranoid about it. I want to assume from the very beginning that I'm going to get scratches on it. And I want to just make that okay somehow in my head. Now, I'm not going to say 
that it's such an easy thing to just say, okay, I'm gonna work in a Rolex and literally have zero worries or concerns about what happens to it. You know, I'm gonna be a little careful. I really don't wanna shatter anything. <sighs> I really don't wanna shatter it. I, I don't wanna dent it, gonk it. I, I don't want it to be, you know, utterly destroyed. But like, you know what? I want it to be used and I want it to have signs that, that I loved it, that I spent time with it. Eventually, I'd like to pass it on to one of my kids and I'd like them to look at it and say, you know, Dad, Dad lived in this thing. Dad showered in this thing. Dad slept in this thing and he worked in it and he loved it and he traveled in it. And, you know, that's, you know, that's what I want to do. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the marketing slogan for Patek is, you never really own a Patek. You merely care for it for the next generation. And, um, of course, that's been adapted to the following joke. You never really own your place on the Rolex waiting list. You just pass it on to the next generation. Um, so I bought this on eBay and I got like uh, what I think is not like a crazy steal on it, but I got a really nice example of the modern production Rolex with box and papers uh, and a two-year parts and labor warranty from a, from a, um, a bricks and mortar location. And uh, so they're very trustworthy and two years and I paid 8,500 bucks. Would a new one have cost me more? Yes, but not a crazy ton more. It would, a new one would have cost me like maybe eight, nine hundred dollars more because of uh, sales taxes. But you know, I just didn't want to wait eight months, nine months. I, in fact, I asked the AD about it and they were so full up on the waiting list that they didn't even want to take a deposit. I kind of have the hankering for a Hulk. And if I get the Hulk in addition to this, then this is the work watch. And Hulk is like, you know, the special special, the one that I just, you know, that I preserve. And I wouldn't make it a safe queen, I'd wear it, but I probably wouldn't work in it. I want you to talk to me in the comments. I'm working very hard to be one of your favorite watch YouTube guys. So tell me what you think. Let's do this again. I've got lots of information I want to share with you. And I want to know, like, am I crazy to think about a, a, a luxury item now and, and to try and use it as a tool watch? I guess, here's my summation on the whole concept. I know I've been rambling a lot, so you know if you're still with me, thanks. But I think I'm just going to go with this watch as its originally intended purpose, which is as a tool watch. I think I'm just going to enjoy it a lot more. Tell me what you think about this in the comments. I will be there chit-chatting with you. Follow me on Instagram. Yeah, I, all the, lots of stuff in the description of this video, so take a look and uh, help me out by preventing me from going full-time on YouTube. Goldberg, peace out.